it, but I'll try to make it a bit new. <laughs> so, as without uh, wasting any further time, I'll move on to introduce uh, COPD as a topic, and then eventually move on to pulmonary rehabilitation. So, the definition of COPD, uh, as we all know, it's a chronic, uh, it's a common preventable and treatable disease that's characterized with persistent respiratory symptoms and airflow limitation that is, uh, that is due to uh, airway or alveolar abnormalities. And it's usually uh, caused by significant exposure to noxious particles or gases. So that brief definition is the definition of COPD. And the etiology, I know this is very small, but it's an interplay between known risk factors like smoking and genetic factors, uh, like some people who maybe have abnormalities in development of lungs or alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, or generally abnormalities in the airways. And also uh, exposures that come on along the way, like we know many infections, uh, tuberculosis, uh, no one has studied like, okay, we know that in Africa, childhood malnutrition, early, early pneumonias, all these things are eventual predictors of uh, COPD in adulthood. And the other one, of course, is uh, I'll show from this uh, graph. This is a graph uh, from the gold slides but it's uh, a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine where the trajectory of COPD is changing uh, from the classic pathway which you see as trajectory one uh, which involves the classic decline in lung function as you reach 60 years or 70 years coming downwards. So the other tra trajectory two, sorry, the other trajectory is, uh, you can see the yellow one, trajectory two, where people don't develop normal lungs, okay? The lung development doesn't reach what would be optimal for the required uh, capacity of an adult. And those people may not have an accelerated decline, but may just have the same rate of decline, but because their peak was not very high, was not optimal, they end up getting COPD as a result of genetic predisposition or factors that affected in a, a suboptimal development of their lungs, like from the pediatric side, you know, like asthmatics may be at risk of that pathway because of altered biology in the early stages. So the others, uh, of course, any acceleration may be in a new event like an infection or risk factors like smoking. So I think this is known already, and the over what we can take from this slide is one: we know that COPD is progressive and it's not going to chew when it comes in, but our objective when it comes in is to halt progression, uh, slow progress, uh, slow down the recurrence of symptoms and prevent exacerbations which make the person symptomatically worse after every episode. <coughs> so uh, a meta-analysis by Holbert and colleagues uh, found about 384 million people living with COPD globally. This was around 2010 and uh, 2006, sorry, and uh, studies were between uh, 20, uh, 1990 and, and 2000. There's another meta-analysis still from this one by Holbert, which was around 2010, which still showed uh, a large global burden. And the disease is higher in uh, people who are more than 40 years, but this changes. Yeah, there was another meta-analysis which found 384 million. So the global prevalence is about 11%, and you can see the confidence intervals, and increasing prevalence in developing countries because of risk factors like biomass and smoking and the like. So from the global perspective, we've had our landmark study in COPD uh, in this country, and you can see the prevalence was 16.2, and the study was done in Masindi, and interesting enough, there was a high prevalence of uh, COPD in the category between 30 to 39 years, which is very uh, dangerous in terms of a precedent, and higher in women, as we saw. Here, the major risk factors were really biomass, among others. 
Uh, as the chair mentioned, I also looked at COPD patients in, uh, in, in the Mulago Joint AIDS program. And these were people infected with HIV. Uh, this is an abstract, uh, but the main risk predictors of COPD in this population was TB, uh, shortness of breath, as reported by most patients, as well as a low BMI. So the predictors dif differ depending on the population that you're looking at, and that's something that we can pay attention to. So why are we uh, looking at this topic today? Uh, for those of you who have lived with patients with COPD or patients with chronic lung diseases, these patients do not have peace, I should say, because their symptoms are recurrent, recurrent. You wake up every day, you're ready to go to work. Him, he has to cough and cough and cough. Then you have to buy needless antibiotics. You have to uh, have limitation of activity with uh, uh, symptoms that are affecting you. So. Uh, COPD carries a large uh, contribution to the disability adjusted life years and burden, as well as high costs, especially in our setting where antibiotics are over the counter. These symptoms really lead to a lot of money being spent needlessly in, in COPD, uh, either poor symptom control or even when exacerbations come in. So the economic burden of COPD, even away from exacerbations, but natural symptomatology. In a, from making you suboptimal in terms of your exercise and capacity to carry out different activities, the overall money spent on symptoms is quite high. And this is where we really want to highlight the role of uh, non-pharmacological management of COPD, uh, which includes pulmonary rehabilitation, which is our topic today. So these are factors which affect disease progression, but I'm sure you are aware of most of these genetic factors, uh, gender, and continuous exposure to noxious particles. And these are some of the topics which are involved in uh, pulmonary rehabilitation. When you hear pulmonary rehabilitation, it actually has a component of patient education. And very many times, pulmonary rehabilitation is thought of as uh, chest physiotherapy, which is actually a much broader term than uh, chest physiotherapy. So I really don't think I should spend time here, but uh, maybe what I should mention is the cardinal symptoms of COPD, which is cough, uh, recurrent cough, shortness of breath, and sputum production. And given the presence of risk factors, we know that our diagnostic tool of importance is spirometry. And from this chart, you can see that these are volume time curves from a spirometer. And I think uh, what I can say is these are respiratory ratios of the uh, first expiratory volume in once. The normal lung, normal person should exhale more than 80% of their air in the first second when you use a forceful exhalation. But uh, in proportion to your total uh, vital capacity, if you're FEV1 uh, over FVC uh, is less than 0 0.7, we subject you to a bronchodilator, which if you maintain a less than 0 0.7 figure, it shows that you have obstruction or delayed emptying of your lungs, leading to retained air in your chest. So again, these are known. Uh, this is the gold classification of uh, COPD, and it, it's uh, based on the categories of the FEV1, uh, more than 80% predicted is a gold one, gold two is 50 to 80%, gold three is less than, is 30 to uh, less than 50, and less than 30% of the predicted FEV1 is a very severe disease. So when you diagnose patients with COPD, uh, as evidence is really showing that you, you might give uh, several treatments based on the classification of the severity in terms of gold grading. But they are not necessarily always linked to the symptomatology of patients. So you must also get the symptom score of patients. And these are some of the, the tools that are available for use, like the COPD assessment tool, which is, used in the, uh, which is very highlighted in the gold guidelines, 
or the Kremlin Christian Questionnaire or the St. George Christian Questionnaire, uh, the MRC Disney score, because this can tell you about the daily impact of uh, COPD on someone's life. So this is uh, also in the revision of the goal 2019, they have tried to emphasize these uh, uh, symptom score tools versus uh, mani uh, adjusting management uh, based on these versus trying to tie this to, like in the previous you would add that, that grade to the functional, to functional score. But now you can use the functional score alone to decide treatment. And this is an example of the COPD assessment tool. And it's a spectrum of severity depending on where the patient uh, feels that they belong in terms of the spectrum in much of these activities of daily living. And so uh, I'm going through this sometimes because I know many of you here have seen it before. And this is the modified this uh, near scale for the MRC. And again, it's a, a progressive spectrum of severity of uh, dyspnea or difficult in breathing based on the symptomatology of uh, patients and how they perceive their functionality. So these are some of the assessments that you do when people are in pulmonary rehabilitation programs that can help you know whether you're assisting a patient in terms of their functionality. Okay, so I'll skip this and go to the next. So in this slide, uh, you can see that uh, this is the refined ABCD assessment tool. And on the lower, on the horizontal axis, you have the modified uh, medical cancer research score, the MRC dyspnea score. And along the vertical line, uh, you have the number of exacerbations, okay? So, uh, as well as the, the CAT, uh, question here. So if, you're, if, for instance, I have one exacerbation and my CAT score is less than 10 or my MRC dyspnea scale is less than 10, I am class A. So I might be gold uh, stage 3, but then my symptoms are class A. However, if I have many exacerbations, uh, let's say two exacerbations or more, or one exacerbation at least leading to an admission. Even when my uh, CAT scores are this, then I'll be great C. So these these are important uh, classifications when it comes to uh, trying to manage uh, patients. As you can see, the different uh, pharmacological approaches that uh, group A you only need a bronchodilator, but then all these other groups you need uh, combined medicines like a long-acting beta agonist beta agonist plus an inhalation of corticosteroids, as well as uh, for group C, the long-acting mas uh, long mascarinic agents like uh, Tiotropium. So this is the pharmacological management of COPD, which is not the focus of our presentation today. But now, again, from the gold uh, guidelines, these are the non-pharmacological uh, strategies of COPD management, which uh, try to prevent exacerbations and optimize uh, symptom control in these patients. So you can see that really uh, pulmonary rehabilitation programs are very pertinent in management of these patients. And this is the focus of our presentation today. Uh, to underscore this, uh, the summary of the guidelines uh, trying to show uh, the non-pharmacological management of COPD. These are the patient groups that we have been talking about, uh, which is patient group A, B up to D from the other uh, symptom uh, control grading. But other than uh, group A, which is more or less asymptomatic, almost all the other groups, uh, pulmonary rehabilitation, uh, comes really as a major management strategy of uh, COPD. And if you recall from the chair, uh, this is not something we are doing uh, really as uh, programs or as COPD uh, managing uh, doctors or people. So now we reach uh, trying to understand what is pulmonary rehabilitation. And maybe this is a field of long uh, definitions. 
again uh, from the American Thoracic Society and European Respiratory Society uh, uh, pro uh, statement of uh, 2013, there was an amendment of the definition of 2006 of COPD, and now pulmonary rehabilitation is defined as a comprehensive intervention based on thorough patient assessment, uh, followed by tailored patient therapies uh, that include but are not limited to exercise training, education, and behavior change, okay? And designed to improve the physical and psychological condition of people with chronic respiratory disease and to promote long-term adherence to health-enhancing behaviors. So from this definition, we see three major components, among others. And this is exercise training, education, as well as behavior change. And these are all designed to improve the functionality and mental state of people living with uh, chronic respiratory disease. So uh, who are the implementers of uh, pulmonary rehabilitation? Virtually all people who are involved really in terms of close management but very much you can see the physicians and all these other health workers, including physiotherapists, respiratory therapists, nurses, psychologists, behavior specialists, nutritionists, social workers. Everyone has a role to play in pulmonary rehabilitation. Okay, and one other outstanding thing is that interventions are based on the unique needs. Remember, this is after thorough patient assessment, and then you tailor the intervention to the needs of the patient. So the goals of pulmonary rehabilitation are to minimize symptom burden, maximize exercise performance, promote patient autonomy in terms of decisions surrounding their management, uh, enhance their activities like daily uh, activities of daily living and improve their quality of life and with long-term enhancing uh, health enhancing behavior change as we'll see along the way. So what are the components of pulmonary rehabilitation? I will highlight the major components, which is exercise training, uh, behavior change, and patient education. So exercise training. What do we mean when we talk about exercise, exercise training? Now, in COPD, uh, the capacity of exercise is largely limited by shortness of breath. And this is one of the main contributors of uh, uh, exercise incapacitation. But the dyspnea in COPD is multifactorial. Uh, it can involve muscle weaknesses or peripheral, what you call peripheral muscle dysfunction, and this is largely uh, inadequacy of muscle, muscle strength uh, from uh, supply of nutrients generally, and eventually deconditioning progresses from that uh, uh, sequence. Then we have what you call dynamic hyperinflation. And the way to understand this is every time you blow out your air when you're exhaling, uh, after exhalation, then you inhale. And more or less like with your tidal volume, when you blow out, you blow out what is required to be blown out on exhalation. Then you inhale and to fill that gap. And our tidal volume is about 500. Now, in COPD, people have incomplete emptying. And with incomplete emptying because of the obstruction, uh, inhalation comes in and finds a partially full lung from what would be expected from a healthy person. So that progressive accumulation of uh, lung volume is uh, what is called dynamic hyperinflation. And it's different from the static hyperinflation, which is uh, generally reduced stretch or recoil of the lungs. That also uh, affects ventilation. Now, Dyspnea is also brought in by uh, increased respiratory load, and this is a combination of several factors, uh, some arising from poor ventilation, others from poor gaseous exchange, and eventually uh, in increased work of breathing, which again contributes to worsening of the shortness of breath. Then the defective gas exchange, uh, many times these people have like uh, dead space, like physiological dead space, uh, more or less pathological, like an emphysema patient, the alveoli are so big they can't uh, contract their, usually alveoli are tethered together, they contract as a unit 
expand as a unit in inspiration and exhalation. But with such uh, COPD patients, uh, if you like emphysema, that because of progressive destruction of alveolar walls, they become sacs which are unable to contract and expand. So you always trap in air, which is not replenishing itself with gas, which uh, vital gas like oxygen. So eventually you have dead space and defective uh, gas exchange in addition to endothelial issues. And then you have the natural decline of lung function, which is age-related. As you know, many of our patients are old, as well as physical deconditioning as a result of age. So as you can see that the capacity, one thing that we want to highlight from this uh, slide is from literature, you actually see that for capacity which is necessary for uh, training intensity and duration to allow modification of skeletal muscles is maintained in, even in severe COPD. So severe COPD does not take away the capacity of muscles to kind of improve in function. That, that capacity for necessary training intensity and endurance and duration to allow skeletal muscle adapt is maintained even in severe forms of COPD. But you have to navigate around to tap into this capacity because eventually it's the one which will help you improve uh, your lung function. And this is now, if you improve skeletal muscle function, then you improve ventilatory capacity. And we'll understand more what this uh, actually entails. But you can sit down here that gains in skeletal muscle function uh, lead to gains in exercise capacity, but you may not be able to detect this maybe with a spirometer, but the functionality of a patient, and these are the intricate uh, uh, nuances that come in in pulmonary rehabilitation, that I may still maintain the same gold category, but my exercise capacity might improve because of increased strength of uh, skeletal muscles. And this uh, increased strength of uh, skeletal muscles also is associated with improved oxidative capacity. Remember, poor oxidation also worsens muscle function. It is also associated with improved efficiency of muscle function and eventual reduced uh, ventilatory requirements. So again, exercise training, if you have borrowed from depressed people, it improves a mood, uh, improves cardiovascular function, the shortness of breath in COPD is largely multifactorial, and many COPD patients also have comorbidities uh, which involve cardiovascular disease. So this underscores the importance of uh, cardiorespiratory assessment of a patient before you take them through uh, uh, a full physical uh, activity, uh, because pulmonary rehabilitation takes about 8 to 12 weeks. So you may need to understand, like sometimes you can use stress ECGs or treadmills to see how much someone can endure to try and, uh, okay, to screen for cardiorespiratory dysfunction because, again, this can be a limitation. Then you, it also, if you do like stressing, it can help you evaluate needs for supplemental oxygen because these are also associated with benefits of, uh, if you give like supplemental oxygen to a person who is exercising muscles, you may eliminate the equation of shortness of breath. Now, my, in, my fatigue in physical function may be because of shortness of breath and physical muscles. But if you give me supplemental oxygen during the activity, you may eliminate shortness of breath's impact. Then you allow me to, to tap into uh, exercising muscles, whose improved function will feed back by improved ventilatory uh, capacity and eventual reduction in what? In shortness of breath. So this is what, like, these are uh, things you can do before uh, exercise training to try and rule out things that may cause uh, problems uh, to uh, optimal exercise functionality. Okay, what is the physiology of exercise limitation? Uh, ventilation, as you know, uh, ventilation is the work of respiratory muscles. This is breathing out and breathing in. This is ventilation. And it involves the several uh, inspiratory muscles as well as the uh, expiratory uh, muscles. So one of the, in COPD, uh, ventilation requirements are high because there is always increased work of breathing. Uh, remember, obstruction leads to more increased work of breathing. 
So that's why you always have high uh, increased respiratory effort. You have a dead space which you have to overcome. Uh, you have deconditioning of muscles. You have outflow obstruction and you have dynamic inflation. So all these uh, combine themselves and offer a ventilatory uh, obstruction to function. So these combined factors can increase your ventilatory requirements. So you can see here that whereas they all, uh, if they all combine, they increase your uh, inspiratory requirements and increase your sense of dyspnea because then they lead to pro uh, worsening ventilatory effort. Now, away from ventilatory effort, you have uh, the exchange, gas exchange limitations, and we have already mentioned that many COPD patients uh, have hypoxia, uh, and exercise triggers more hypoxia. So as you exercise, you become more hypoxic, uh, cardio, uh, baro, the carotid uh, bodies sense your levels of carbon monoxide, they trigger, they trigger increased ventilation. Uh, then you have uh, lactic acid uh, accumulation, uh, then this is also going to lead to muscle fatigue. So you're now not only getting uh, uh, hyperventilation with increasing your work of breathing, you're also getting lactic acid buildup, which is wearing out your muscles. So again, this is going to cause you to tire out early. So these gas, uh, and if you break down lactic acid, again, you build more carbon dioxide, which may trigger more uh, increased uh, ventilatory effort. So again, so this is some way where you can see that sometimes supplemental oxygen may do what? May, may reduce the production of lactic acid and allow more endurance uh, during uh, physical activity in exercise training to allow you to prolong uh, uh, pulmonary rehabilitation endurance. And it also has these other advantages of carotid body inhibition because of low CO2 levels. So you might, at the start, sometimes for some patients who have very severe disease, you may need to assess a need for supplemental oxygen such that you can allow patients to endure and over time as they improve, maybe they can have less demands. So that's another component. From ventilatory, we now have gas uh, exchange limitation. And now you have the cardiac limitation, and here we have the role uh, of pulmonary hypertension, uh, which eventually uh, leads to, uh, which this can be the result of hypoxia causing vessel constriction or narrowing in the pulmonary vessels, uh, remodeling uh, because of vascular injury, COPD has inflammatory changes, and increased resistance because hypoxia again is going to lead to build up um, more generation of red cell mass. All these can lead to impaired flow through the pulmonary uh, vasculature. So the eventual pulmonary hypertension in the severe forms, of course, goes to co-pulmonal. But for that, you may have, you have like functional impairments because if the right ventricle becomes big, then the septum shifts uh, towards the left. In exercise, you need a highly functional left ventricle. So. Uh, trying to have an L, uh, left ventricle which can keep up with the rate of demand during physical activity will be impacted if your right ventricle has hypertrophied. So this is again important to, uh, this is an important contributor of exercise limitation. So then you have lower limb uh, muscle dysfunction. Now this uh, is a combination of uh, factors shortness of breath, then you have peripheral muscle, deconditioning, uh, you have muscles which are not well nourished, uh, oxidative uh, damage, uh, reactive oxygen species, so uh, corticosteroid use as they are common and they are associated myopathies. So eventually you have people who report fat fatigue is one of the most uh, reported uh, symptoms, especially in psycho-based activity like either repetitive exercises, they cause the muscles to uh, develop these factors cause development of contractile uh, fatigue, which eventually leads patients to tear out very quickly. So, uh, again, here it's important to note that COPD patients tend to have a higher lactic acid production than other normal healthy controls, which, as we have seen in the earlier slides, in increases their ventilatory requirements and increases the work of breathing that muscles have to overcome. And 
COPD patients also have a, an increased tendency of ox, uh, carbon dioxide retention, which leads to lactic acidemia. So these combined factors lead to early exercise termination because of still worsening uh, functionality of respiratory muscles. So here I highlight that improving skeletal muscle function uh, is a pertinent goal for exercise training because it eventually improves ventilatory effort in pulmonary rehabilitation. Now there is a whole judgment about the skeletal muscle abnormalities in chronic respiratory disease which can be looked up uh, in literature. Sorry, I have allergies. So now you have again further limitations of exercise are caused by uh, limitations of respiratory muscles. There are several respiratory muscles, the intercostal, like for inspiration you have intercostal muscles, uh, stenocleidomastoid, uh, latissimus dorsi, all these muscles around uh, the chest are really involved very much in inspiration, including the major muscle which is the diaphragm. Now, one thing to note is uh, diaphragms in COPD patients kind of try to adapt to the increased work of uh, the chronic overload and eventually develop a greater capacity to function. But their adaptability uh, in terms of increasing their effort is overcome by the dynamic and static hyperinflation uh, that we have talked about, which kind of changes the, if the chest is now, uh, changes the natural shape of the chest where the diaphragm can easily contract downwards. This chest is already maybe increased in anterior posterior diameter, may rounded already, so the capacity of the diaphragm's adaptation in strength to overcome uh, this uh, functional, sorry, this structural uh, kind of function which eventually results into structure because of increased air trapping, abnormalities of the lung, place the diaphragm at a mechanical disadvantage to overcome the functional limitations even when it tries to adapt. So it's then eventually you still have a buildup of carbon dioxide, more dyspnea, desaturation and reduced exercise performance. So from these uh, different factors, you can see that uh, when a patient comes in with COPD, uh, the quickest temptation, if I have an exacerbation, is to give me a bronco agonist and think that all will be what? All will be well with my function. But from what we have seen, this is not true. And looking deeper into this topic, I also try to understood, understand the limitations these patients have in terms of functionality. It is not laziness or one problem that is causing exercise limitation. It's a whole spectrum of uh, uh, issues that are affecting what? Exercise in these patients. And these are some of the important take home messages from this uh, topic. So principles of training, just to tap into a bit what happens in uh, pulmonary rehabilitation. Remember exercise training is one major component. Uh, principles involve the train muscles for endurance, uh, then you have interval training. Some people are so functionally incapacitated they can't do progressive uh, activity. But what I saw from the literature is assessment for COPD specifically, and not other things like maybe cardiac disease or what, but for COPD generally, uh, there's not much difference, or in fact there's no significant difference. If someone can do continuous activity, or if someone can pulse the activity and say, I can do 30 minutes rest, do 30 minutes, it's more or less can yield the same optimal outcomes. They also do resistance or strength testing and muscles to improve that. They train upper limbs, they train lower limbs. So in pulmonary rehabilitation, as you have seen from the holistic approach to uh, ventilation, is it's not only uh, mus like flexibility training is the one which doesn't have so much known uh, advantages. And this involves different posturings of the of the chest or thorax to try and improve ventilation, which you would have thought would have the highest yield, but it's a combination of the other muscle trainings that lead to benefits. Now, one principle that we should not forget is to maximize benefits. And like I said, if I am chronic bronchitis, then my uh, prolonged vessel, my chronic vessel constriction causes shortness of breath. Give me a long-acting beta agonist before the exercise. 
that kind of widens my airways and allows you, me to eliminate or reduce that problem to now tap into the next problem of muscle, muscle weakness to allow more endurance. So it is important to know how to optimize. And again, if as exercise goes on, these patients keep building up and uh, because now inspiration, uh, expiration is coming in quickly because of exercise. So you uh, and uh, breathing pressures are quite high. So sometimes you may need uh, this non-invasive uh, ventilatory support. You arm it to the patient to try and overcome the positive pressures to allow more inspiratory ease, but to allow continued endurance of the exercise. So that is something about exercise, and I don't know how much time I have yet, but, uh, okay, so 10 minutes. Eh? Okay. So briefly, the second component is a behavior change and collaborative self-management. Now, what are the things that we talk about? Now, the, away from the underlying uh, pathology, many of the functional impairments in COPD may also come along with perception, they may impair quality of life, and they may people may adapt differently to the same pathology. But my, my symptoms may be more perceived because of maybe how I perceive the disease, or I am dying, uh, and all this. So behavior change tries to uh, optimize the patient's understanding of the disease and to help them adapt to the symptoms that they have. And here the strategies are aimed at early recognition of signs of maybe uh, uh, signs of uh, an exacerbation, early intervention, and also trying to help them overcome the, the functional limitations. Let me give you examples of this. This behavior change includes, uh, among many things, uh, cognitive behavior therapy. Now, under this, there is uh, something called operant conditioning. And here the, the principle, the theory is recurrence of a behavior depends on its consequences. For instance, if you tell me that this breathing technique during exercise uh, may work for you, if I do it and I, I yield more meters in the six, walking, six minute walking uh, distance, then that reinforces and the patient has some motivation to carry on that activity again. So that apparent conditioning can help is, is what you're trying to tap into. And the emphasis here is not to bring a super formula, but to try and uh, help the patient figure out what things work for them in different scenarios to improve their function. This is part of the CBT of a pulmonary rehabilitation. Then changing co cognition is, this is mainly about beliefs, ideas about, uh, okay, the consideration that beliefs, ideas are strong determinants of emotion, and behavior, for instance, and these may change over time depending on patient experiences. So an example here, a patient may not use a drug if over time their cognition gives them that this drug is not useful. So even if you think, you explain and what, but the patient has their bias. You've seen this, the, the, like the standard treatment of malaria here is caught. You reach someone, someone's like, me caught him doesn't work on me. Me, panad, paracetamol, that's weak for me, you know? But these are based on evidence. So this kind of apparent, uh, sorry, this cognitive uh, uh, behavior patterns are the ones which uh, the behavior change in pulmonary rehabilitation tries to tap into. And here, if a patient, let's say, uh, as we know that these patients have chronic shortness of breath, but if every time the patient, let's say, walks on that, uh, uh, maybe walks from place A to place B to try and exercise, shortness of breath comes in, and the, the mind triggers to, I am dying, I am suffocating. That will kind of tell them, slow down, don't try that, keep in your small uh, pocket of not exercising. Then that leads to them never trying to do exercise, and eventually that's the downward spiral of ventilatory function. So this is what cognitive uh, behavior therapy tries to do, and it has components of self-efficacy. This is the principle of uh, a patient uh, contributing positively and know, uh, to their health, overall health, and knowing that this, this and this and this work for me, this and this and this 
don't work for me. And they evolve all these strategies that health, uh, health workers can use, either experiences from peer patients that at first are doing this badly, maybe if you run like this, or if you feel like this, try a bronchodilator if you try it. So these are like peer groups in pulmonary rehabilitation setups. And also trying to uh, really under understand this master experience is some something like reinforcing and trying to undermine failure. If I try strategies and they lead me to feeling bad, don't castigate me, try and help me try other strategies. So it eventually you have to do what we call collaborative management. You agree on a management plan with the patient, then you write down goals and you keep revising them over time. So the other component is education away from behavior, and this is mainly an ongoing process uh, educational topics concerning uh, nutrition, understanding of their disease, uh, function of uh, the respiratory system, uh, different aspects, uh, smoking cessation and benefits. So you need to make sure patients understand the disease such that they can participate in their management and prevent uh, downward spiral of poor quality of life. Then the other one is to also initiate topics regarding advanced care planning. Uh, for instance, in one study in this uh, reference I was looking at like 30% of COPD patients who died like one month before their death, they did not know, they thought maybe they would die in two years or one year, so they can't know if, uh, how do I plan these symptoms? If I'm having shortness of breath, does it mean I'm dying? What's the natural history of my disease and any other advance orders that they may want, but trying to initiate some conversations of the progression of the disease might help patients understand better. So uh, from all these, then it looks like pulmonary rehabilitation may be perceived as rigorous. What is the optimal timing? So most times people have had pulmonary rehabilitation uh, in uh, only the severe forms of COPD, thinking that's where there is benefit. Now, from newer data, uh, benefits of uh, pulmonary rehabilitation cut across almost all stages of uh, COPD. Uh, because one is the observation that the correlation between airflow limitation and symptoms like dyspnea, overall health status, exercise performance is not strong enough to say that if you're gold stage two, this is your shortness, this is your weakness. <coughs> These other symptoms may uh, be there even in gold stage one, gold stage two, and not necessarily only stage three or stage four disease. But if you don't work on them, then again you progress quite quicker uh, versus someone who has them. So the thing is, even after an exacerbation, you can introduce pulmonary rehabilitation shortly after discharge, in, during discharge, or after discharge. It is safe even after an exacerbation. Okay, so what things are involved in pulmonary rehabilitation? So there are many tools that can be used uh, to assess patient-centered outcomes. And here you can use the symptom score, like the MRC dyspnea uh, score, fatigue assessment, which can assess intensity or impact of the intervention, depression scores, uh, functionality uh, tools like Kanofsky, uh, then there are multiple symptom assessment tools like the CAT tool, St. George Respiratory Questionnaire, uh, the Clinical COPD Questionnaire, which has been used around here as well, and exercise performance tools. Now, exercise performance tools may involve like the field walking tests. An example of this is the six minute walking distance, and this is done like you can even do it on that walkway, you can do it in a pitch, you can do it anywhere. You have to just put uh, point A and point B, then keep marking like, it's the distance is 30 meters, and you can keep marking maybe every five or 10. So the patient, you start your timer, and you're like, okay, start walking, then the patient starts walking, and when they reach the end, they go around. So they keep walking, and over six minutes, you just keep encouraging them a bit, and you're like, how much distance can they cover at their self pace over uh, 30 minutes? And this is why you are saying that it's not expensive to do pulmonary rehabilitation. You can also do the incremental shuttle walk test. And this is one which requires a shorter distance, like 10 meters uh, from like point A up to the end of the wall. And the patient here follows the timer. 
Uh, it rains, boop, then I begin walking, then I reach the other end. Uh, then I wait, so it then sounds again. So it keeps calculating for you how much time you need to walk from point A to point B. So over, as the time goes, it increases, begins reading, boop, then you walk. Before you reach the other side, it's saying, boop, boop, then you're like, hey, I, am, I need to work harder. So you, it, as you achieve, it keeps increasing the frequency of your, uh, how much you need to walk from point A to point B. And it's interesting that with this timer now, you, you work against the what? The timer. You stop when the patient is progressively fading to reach like by a half a meter. And I, I found that these are all easy to really modify into uh, what can be done. Uh, so these are so this is a picture of the six-minute uh, walking uh, test, uh, a graduated uh, uh, corridor, which can be done from anything. This is a, a picture adopted from a presentation by Dr. Katajira from a previous pulmonary rehabilitation program. As you remember, the physiotherapy department, where it used to be. Um, this is some the walking across uh, for that six-minute uh, walking distance. So this can be adopted and the work from that exercise is what you see uh, in this study and at least we have two of the authors in here and one thing that you can see is it was feasible, clinically important improvements were seen in quality of life. Uh, maybe what this, the important thing from this uh, 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 exercise performance tools is what is called the minimal clinically important difference. And this is the gain that is associated with substantial improvement in the lung function. And it is set for various, like the six minute walking test, it is, for most studies they have quoted around 54 meters uh, improvement, maybe after a pulmonary rehabilitation, being associated with benefit. And here you can, you can see uh, the incremental uh, Shuttle walking test was 299. Uh, this is what they had at baseline. And then after the uh, rehabilitation, this is what they have. So these are the different uh, improvements that you find in pulmonary rehabilitation. Now, looking at other non-COPD uh, non diseases, this is a summary a bit of the different uh, studies which have looked at the role of pulmonary rehabilitation in other chronic lung diseases and the general message is in many of them it, ha it has benefit. So this is my second last slide. Uh, there have been uh, efforts regarding pulmonary rehabilitation. The first one was a 2006 uh, state of statement by the ATS and ARS. The second one is which really talks about comprehensively advances in pulmonary rehabilitation is that 2013 statement. Uh, of pulmonary rehabilitation, which was very much the source of the work I've talked about today, because the summary of different meta-analyses and different studies in this topic. And why I highlighted the 2015 statement, and these are the things that pulmonary rehabilitation, so the statement says, uh, what can I, uh, enhancing implementation, use and delivery of pulmonary rehabilitation. And the rationale is pulmonary rehabilitation has demonstrated physiological, uh, symptom reducing, psychosocial, and health economic benefits for patients with chronic respiratory diseases, but it remains underutilized. The objective for this statement of 2015 is to uh, enhance implementation, use, and delivery of pulmonary rehabilitation uh, in management of uh, suitable patients. Worldwide, as you know, much of these diseases will not show up, but all these disadvantages will be significantly reduced by pulmonary rehabilitation. So, what does what we have for the future? Uh, we have uh, what's under construction is the Kupuma House for Heart Lung Rehabilitation, the Lung Institute, and my personal wish. Uh, this is something I've thought about because of the ease with pulmonary rehabilitation programs. You know, we, there are many sophistications that come around mentality and mindset. For instance, uh, in, like in pediatrics, you have the blunt air coma scale for what? 
for children. It says, eye opening, directed, followed, not following. Appropriate re response to what? To a cry. But it's a sophisticated word, blunter in Malawi, you know? Then you, well, uh, what's the other one of uh, encephalopathy? Uh, West having criteria for scoring encephalopathy. It says uh, no subtle changes, uh, small uh, changes in mood, grade one, grade two. Then it becomes, you know, a widely unrecognized Glasgow Coma scale. So with, with this, I think we can adopt something that can be called the Kampala model of pulmonary rehabilitation and just try and look at the literature and what things we can involve in a package of pulmonary rehabilitation. And this is something that can be done almost in all district hospitals in the country. They all have compounds, people hang their clothes there, people do what. So I think, for me, I really think this is something we just need to get a standardized uh, from these uh, different physical testing things that we've said. And so this is maybe what we have as a Kampala model and maybe try to like, expand it globally. And people will adopt it because there is no really uh, known modality for our low middle income countries for, uh, for pulmonary rehabilitation. And the other thing is I think uh, over time there will need to be emphasis on introduction of pulmonary rehabilitation in training programs. This can be recommendations to training uh, departments like the College of Health Sciences Department of Medicine, uh, surgery where they have thoracic uh, patients, uh, sports people, and then of course pursuit of funding to roll these things out even when it's not too much, but very much increased awareness which we are doing today in regard of a day of lung science. With that, I really end my talk today. Thank you.